afraid to share that, but come and join us. Thursday, Spring General Store, 315. We try to end it in an hour, but it never happens. Good to have all of you here. Let us join together in our song of preparation sanctuary, and we're going to sing it like we do at church camp. The first two verses with guitar, and then the third verse, a cappella. It's printed in your bulletin. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, dry and
please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletins. As God's people together, let us confess our sins. Holy God, forgive the thoughts of our hearts as well as our actions, for we confess that we are not holy. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Cleanse us, we pray, for we long to be like Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I declare to you the good news. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I declare to you the truth that Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. So turn to one another and pass the peace of Christ. Saying, the peace of Christ, be with you. Surprise. Young people, forward for our children's message. Come on now. There you go, girls. You want to sit by Ruby here? There you go. So what is starting tomorrow, Tuesday in Mount Air? I don't know when at Orient. What starts, do you know, Ruby? School! All right, how many of you are excited that school is starting? Yeah. Some of you? That means mom might be off teaching, right? Hmm? Cool. My mom teaches. Yes, your mom teaches. Perfect. And dad too, right? Yes. Perfect. Some of the dads are teaching too. Well, I want to tell you about when I was young and I went to school and guess what they told me before I went? That you weren't allowed to pray in school. I thought that sounded kind of Strange, because I prayed all the time in school. Like, when I got in trouble, I prayed that they wouldn't punish me too hard. When I forgot to do my homework, I prayed that God would give me special knowledge. Well, guess what I found out, though? The teacher just couldn't get up there at the front of the class and offer a prayer for everybody and out loud or the principal couldn't get on and speak into the microphone and pray a prayer. But could I pray at school? Yes, and I did. I can't remember a day at school that I didn't pray. And that's what I want to tell all of you. Whether where you go to school is a high school, or an elementary school, or a preschool, you can pray. You can ask God to be with you, to help you, to give you patience, to bless you. God hears your prayers wherever you are. At church, in school, at home, even at play. And so I have a song that I learned back when I was young that I thought I'd teach you today. It's a prayer. It's printed in the bulletin. And it goes like this. Dear God, please help me to say kind words to all my friends today. help us. Dear God, please help me to say kind words to all my friends today. Dear God, please help me to play with all my friends in a happy way. Thank you, and before I send you back to your seats, we have bags today for you to 
the tape back with a coloring sheet. And maybe a little candy. You can take it back to your seat and work with it there. We have one for everyone. Here we go. You may return to your seat. So, just a sec, Rival. Can I have you give one to Savannah? Savannah's great Julie's office. Prayer concerns today, joys and concerns, as we lift them up to the Lord. Rival? Rival on Friday had an 18th birthday. And he wants you all to know it, that he had a great celebration with chocolate cake with pineapple and cherries. So Rival, congratulations on turning 18. And thank you for being our usher today. Other joys, concerns. Connie? For the people of Afghanistan. For the people of Haiti, after an earthquake and tropical storm. And also we'll add to that the people of Middle Tennessee, where I was informed this morning and shown pictures of terrible flooding about an hour south of Nashville, 10 dead, 40 missing, 15 inches of rain caused by the hurricane coming up the coast. I believe so. That, yeah, well that's the one that's hitting Long Island. So hurricanes, storms, war, we lift up all the situations in the world. Others today? Susan Agins continues in hospice, has been able to get out the last several days, spend some time outside, praying that she might just continue to have as many good days as possible. Susan Agins and Willie, we lift them up. Any others today? Steve? Care Center. Those in the Care Center. And we should be reminded again that Ellen Grace Brown, Laura's mother, is about to celebrate her 106th birthday. It's on the 30th, and I'm sure she'd love to get a card from you, Ellen Grace Brown. Any others today that need to be lifted up? Families of Dean Norton and Ed Nathan. The Norton family and the Naven family. We lift them up in our prayers today. Mom's going to go to the doctor this next Thursday and uh, get an x-ray. And I pray that uh, her shoulder is healing so she won't have to have surgery. Darlene Freeman, who's out of Vintage Park, and prayers that her shoulder will heal and she'll not need further surgery. Thank you. Any others? Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we live in a world of difficult choices. We pray for the people of Afghanistan today, for those who are caught in the chaos, for those who are fleeing terror. We pray, Lord, that decisions might be made by those who have power to do so, that might protect the people the common people. We pray also for the people of Haiti, so many exposed to danger by an earthquake that destroyed so many homes. And the people just in Middle Tennessee, Lord, where there was great destruction, loss of life, and people missing. Lord, as there are hurricanes and tornadoes, we pray that you would be with those affected. And that you would help us reach out with generous hearts. We pray for those in the care center and those who are at Vintage Park. We pray for Ann Sawyer, 
As she prepares for a surgery for Darlene Freeman, she heals from a shoulder wound. We pray for the Norton family and the Navin family. We lift up the people in the care center, including Ellen Grace Brown, and those struggling with cancer, including Susan Higgins. Oh Lord, give her good days. Many, many good days is our prayer. The unspoken concerns of our hearts, Lord, we lift up to you, praying the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our meditation hymn is 65. I did a worship service this week at Mount Air, and I had a pianist that I did not know. She played this song, and I thought, we ought to sing it today. Verses 1, 2, and 4. My Jesus, I love thee, I know.
want to stand together for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We thank you, O oh God, for your goodness and grace. We thank you for Bible. Turning 18 and being an usher for the first time, Lord, continue to bless him in his journey. Bless all our youth and children and keep them in your care. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading comes to us today from Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 through 12. Hannah will do most of the reading, but I'm going to read a verse or now, every now and then, to highlight. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's been 11 years since I first read The Hunger Games, a young adult fiction book written by Suzanne Collins, recommended to me by my wife and daughters. I read it on the plane ride from New York City to Athens, Greece, where we were visiting our daughter Naomi doing a semester abroad. And I read the sequel, Catching Fire, on the plane trip home. Can't remember how long after that I read the third book in the trilogy, Mockingjay, but that was my least favorite of the three because it was so relentlessly somber, so difficult to read because so many key characters got killed off in a war in which there seemed to be no winners. Only losers. On the other hand, it was a realistic book. Because in modern war, there seems to be no winners. Only losers. And the real losers aren't members of any government, but common soldiers and ordinary citizens who, if they're fortunate enough to survive the fighting, lose out on so many opportunities and live in perpetual fear or grief or with nightmares. Anyway, the Hunger Games trilogy is written 
in the first person narrative, and the narrator is Katniss Everdeen, a young girl who volunteers in place of her younger sister to fight in a ritual known as Hunger Games, in which 24 representatives, two from each of 12 districts, are placed in an arena and forced to fight to the death. The games are televised throughout the country, found to be exciting and amusing by the privileged, but horrifyingly brutal and horrible for the poor, for the people whose teenage children are actually involved in the fight. Those books were hugely popular in the United States. But I got to thinking this week, I bet they weren't all that popular in Afghanistan, where people have been pawns in war games for 50 years with hardly a break. And again, it's the common soldiers and the common people who suffer. I won't go into any further details about the book or about Afghanistan, but I want to call your attention to a line that is repeated more than once in the book. In fact, it's a line that's found in all three of those books. Remember who the enemy is. It's a piece of wisdom spoken to Katniss, the narrator, by her mentor before she enters the arena to compete in the Hunger Games. And the intent is to help her remember that the real enemies she fights against are not the other kids that she is forced to kill or be killed, but those in power who have forced those kids to come together to fight for the death. It's important for Katniss in the midst of the chaos to help her remember who the real enemy is. And so it is for us today. We're in a world where everyone seems to be fighting against everyone else. Blame games get thrown around. Hostile remarks are made. There's hatred and animosity. But the Apostle Paul tells us in our scripture for this morning, which is a lectionary passage, remember who the real enemy is. Paul says, and I quote, our struggle in this world is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It surprises me that so many people in our world today claim not to believe in the spiritual forces of evil, in Satan, or in demons. Now, it's one thing not to believe in the devil that's been depicted in our culture as a comical figure with a red suit and a pointed tail and a pitchfork. But it's quite another. To look around in our world today, all the violence, all the hatred, all the greed, and not believe in the spiritual forces of evil. Jesus is certainly clear in his teaching. He often talks about demons and evil spirits. And he takes action against such spiritual forces of evil, letting the spirits know that they will not just be given free reign to torment God's people. Why, Jesus even calls Peter, his faithful disciple Satan one time, for setting his mind on things of humans and not on divine things. I believe it's one of Satan's tactics to keep us focused on human battles, on getting even with those who do us wrong, on hating our enemies, on fighting and trying to win every argument because it keeps us fighting with one another and keeps us divided. Perhaps we need to remember who the enemy is. The enemy is the spiritual forces of evil. 
But remembering who the enemy is is only part of where we need to be and what we need to do. We have to fight against that enemy. Remembering if we fight in our own power and strength, we'll lose. That's why the Apostle Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and put on the whole armor of God that we be able to stand firm against the spiritual forces of evil. Now this is the part of the passage that perhaps you've heard many times before, some of you, about putting on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. You know what scripture says? That Satan is the author of lies. So you can't fight Satan with lies or untruths or half-truths. You have to be honest with yourself and with one another. And that begins by admitting that we're sinners. Yes, we strive to be generous, but oftentimes we're selfish. We strive to put sin aside. That it gets the better of us. We strive to forgive, but there's part of us that wants to get even or hold grudges. We have to be honest with ourselves. For if we say we're without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's 1 John. So we need to strive to be more righteous, more Christ-like, while admitting the truth. We fall short. But again, we can claim God's righteousness made available to us in Jesus Christ. And then we can put on our feet whatever will make us ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Again, metaphorically, you can't put on the boots of war if you want to proclaim the gospel of peace. And of course, we need the shield of faith, Paul says. Not a faith that we create, one that suits us, but faith in Jesus Christ who will call you to do things you don't want to do. Who will ask you to go places you don't want to go. But it's faith in Christ that allows us to fight against Satan and the forces of evil. Or as John puts it, in his first letter, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. We once had a member of the Sharpsburg Church named Lori Howard. She's gone to be with the Lord now. But I like Lori's focus on who the real enemy was. I watched her sit down one day at church. And I noticed she had the word Satan written across the bottom of her shoe. I said to her, Lori, why did you put Satan's name on your shoe? She said, because every time I get tempted by the wiles of the devil, I grind my foot into the ground and I'm grinding Satan. I kind of laughed and thought, wow, maybe we should all do that. Grind Satan into the ground under our shoes. Valerie practices that with Satan. She just shared with Satan. Rival. <laughs> Telling him to jump up and down and stomp on Satan when the feelings of rage and anger come. Good job, rival. Well, above all else, Paul says, put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, sometimes Satan and the forces of evil distract us from the real work we're trying to do of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing the Word of God. Do you know the Pharisees once came to Jesus trying to get him to quit teaching and healing by saying, do you know that King Herod is out to get you? That he's trying to kill you? Jesus responded, Go tell that fox that I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day I will finish my work. 
Jesus was saying that even if he was put to death, he would not stop doing what God came, called him to do, what he came to earth to do, to fight against Satan, to cast out demons, to heal people, to die for the sins of the world. And after Jesus told the Pharisees to go tell that fox that he would keep working, he wept and prayed for the people of Jerusalem. And that's how Paul ends this passage in Ephesians. He urges Christians to keep alert, to pray for the saints, to pray that the Holy Spirit might fill them, and to pray for him. Not that he might be released from his chains, but that he might have the courage to proclaim the gospel no matter what came against him. I close my sermon today by asking all of you to pray for the people of Afghanistan, for Christians there now subject to great persecution, to all of those who are feeling tormented by the evil forces in the heavenly places. Pray that God may give us strength that God might give strength to all of God's people. Please join me in the prayer of invocation printed in the bulletin to conclude the sermon. Let us pray together. Help us, O oh God, for we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and powers of darkness. Help us to stand firm in our faith through every trial that comes our way. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 456, God of Grace and God of Glory. Stand as we sing together. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people for thy power, crown thy ancient church's story, bring her but to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.